Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to be together, whether we're joining together in person or online. It's uh, a blessing to be able to gather together to, uh, to sing God's praises, to lift up our voices in prayer, to open his word and to respond to it as well. And so our prayer this morning is that you are blessed through our worship time this morning. In addition to all the regular things we do in worship, we also have the privilege and opportunity this morning of, uh, of celebrating the Lord's uh, Supper, celebrating communion. And so as you prepare your hearts for worship this morning, I want to invite the elders to uh, bring forward and to present the elements of communion this morning. Join me in the litany from Psalm 90. Lord, 
you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are our God. You turn the people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like the days that are set us down. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning. Let's sing. Praise is rising. I join together in praise and as we welcome the Lord here, the Lord welcomes you as well with grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Amen. As God has greeted you, take a moment to greet those around you this morning.
So St. Augustine is attributed to having written in his confessions, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. I don't know about you, but I take great assurance in those words, written so long ago that still describe, I think, human existence and some of the angst and restlessness we feel. And I'm reminded that our God rem invites us to come, to come to him and rest. He invites us whether we feel like it or not. And he invites us to share our joys with him and our frustrations and sorrows. So let's come to him today and pray, shall we? We turn our hearts to you, our creator, in praise and in prayer. We thank you for making us in your image, for knowing us before we were born, for planning us out to the last detail, for equipping us with gifts, and for filling us with your spirit. We thank you for your beauty and the hospitality that we see reflected in your people and in your mighty creation. We appreciate your hand in the building clouds and late night rainstorms. Your design illuminated in the dew caught in a spider's web. For startlingly growth and the pleasure of growing vegetables and the sweat of hard work or a long hike. You provide for us, giving us tasks in your kingdom and giving us time to rest in you. So on this Sabbath, Lord, we come to you for renewal, for we are in need of you to make us whole. As we worship, listen to your word, and participate in your supper, help us to remember you and who we are in you. We refabricate us, Lord, weave us together. For some people, Lord, this week has been particularly draining. We are hurting. Friends and loved ones are grieving. We lift up Kerwin Van Wy and his family. We lift up John and Carolyn Smith for the unexpected deaths in their families. We lift up those, too, who are experiencing sudden changes in health. For those who are assisting ailing spouses, parents, and friends. We ask for your restoration for those who are sick or recovering from surgeries. For some people, Lord, this week has been really busy and has brought opportunity to learn, to teach, to guide, and to care for people. And while each interaction can bless us, we also ask for your renewal where our social capacity is draining. For some, the responsibilities of life have caused anxiety this week. We have duties to do, obligations to fulfill, decisions to make, and we feel overwhelmed. The pathway to peace feels blocked. There is so very much competing for our attention, for the news in our world, so often it, it's bad. Information overload of suffering and scandal, of more hostility and hatred and horror and injustice than we can possibly engage with compassion. For some people, Lord, this week has yielded frustrations. We have prayed earnestly to you, yet feel that you are not answering. We have waited for you to use us, and we feel disappointed and confused when no such call manifests. We fear that we have failed you. We know that we have certainly failed others. And there are those who have failed us. 
we ask for your forgiveness. We wrestle with our own failures, not just our personal ones, but also our failure to live as one body, to be a church, First Church Denver, and a denomination that lives in love, truth, and grace. We confess our behavior and language causes offense. It judges, it harms, it excludes. Deliver us, Lord, from ourselves from our unhealthy ties to tradition, from our want to control and silence differing voices and people's stories. Deliver us from fear of your reformation in our lives. Where there are doubts, give us a new sense of trust in the power of your love. Where there's apathy or tim timidity in our walk, renew the joy of our salvation. Where there is social pressure to be or to do more, may we find contentment and confidence as your children. You love us. And may the stresses of obligation, reputation, and deadline here dissolve. May we find rest in the renewed certainty that we need not be feared or respected or popular or successful or somehow perfect to be loved by you. In love, deliver us, O oh Lord. You are our everything. Amen. From the love of my own comfort From the fear of having not been From a life of worldly passion
Amen. As we continue to worship our God who provides for all of our needs, one of the ways that we thank him for that is we give of our financial tithes and our offerings. This morning you have the opportunity to give to the First Church General Fund. Um, as usual, you can give online or mail a check-in or we have boxes in the back. Um, our treasurer, Kyle Van Andel, is going to come up and give us an update on our Thank you. This is really just a quick update and reminder that we have about two weeks left in our fiscal year. And in order to end the year in the black, we need to push a little bit. As you can see from this table, it's in the bulletin every month. I wanted to make sure everyone kind of understands what they're looking at, though. It might not make sense to everyone, or you might just glance over it and think the numbers will work out at the end of the year, which hopefully they do. But um, that's why I'm here, because we have, a, yeah, two weeks left. So the Look, just looking at the top table there, the first line is the month, and the second one is year to date. So every month our budget is the same, um, but income and expenses is really the, the cash that we take in and the cash that goes out. So last month, the month of June, we ended the year spending $5,600 more than we took in, which has put us in the red of at uh, $4,975 for the year. So we need to make up for that deficit in the month of July if we want to end the year in the black. Uh, the CEF, CEAF fund at the bottom too, I'll just quickly touch on. Uh, the balance as of 630 was 746 and we write those checks at the beginning of every month. So it looks like we're positive, but we obviously dropped uh, negative right after we sent that payment out. So we need to pick up uh, that fund a bit too to, to stay in the black for the year. So. Any questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer anything or provide more data, for more details if anything is, is helpful or confusing about this. But that was all I was going to cover this, this morning. So thanks. Thanks, Kyle. As we uh, prepare to hear God's word together uh, up here, I want to ask uh, our, our, our children to come forward who will be going downstairs to, to hear God's word in an age-appropriate way as they uh, sing together and pray together and, and hear God's word there as well. I'm assuming they're going to sing and pray, to, pray today. So, Karen, I just, I, just laid the, I just laid the gauntlet for you there. So. Good morning, everybody. You ready to share our blessing together this morning? All right. Listen to these words. May your words, O oh Lord, be always on our minds, on our lips, and deep in our hearts. <laughs> That's right. And also with you. <laughs> right. Good job. You may follow Miss Karen down this morning. And I want to invite you to open your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 38 through 42. It's on page uh, 1041 in your Bibles in front of you. I almost said 10,000 again, and then, and then I pictured Joel Yonker laughing at me again. You 
I'm going to throw an order for this to work. I'm going to have to grab my sermon. All right. So from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Um, when I preached a few weeks ago, we, uh, we, we read from a couple chapters back in Luke. Again, the topic was, uh, was discipleship, and we're going to carry on with that topic a little bit today as we talk about uh, what, again, might be a familiar story, but hopefully we can... Uh, unpack it in a little bit, um, maybe new ways this morning. So, again, from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Family of God, this is the word of the Lord. Every day, we make choices. One day earlier this week, I uh, tried uh, to be conscious of all the choices that I was making throughout the day. So my laundry list went something like this. I first had to, just had to decide when my alarm went off whether I was going to get up or hit the snooze button. It's actually a pretty easy decision, to be honest. The harder decision is how many times am I going to hit the snooze button. I had to decide how hot or cold my shower was going to be that morning. I had to decide whether to close up the windows in our house right when I got up or to wait a little while and maybe let the house kind of breathe a little bit as the day goes on and then close the windows up later or more accurately make my kids close the windows later. I had to decide which clothes to wear. There's lots of choices there. I had to decide what I wanted to have for breakfast that morning. I had to decide what kind of coffee I wanted, if I wanted to make it at home or make it here at church or buy it at some store on the way in or not have coffee at all, I guess. I guess that's a choice, I guess. I had to decide which way I wanted to drive to work. There's many ways I can take to get there in the morning. I had to decide once I got here where to park. There's actually a few options around. I had to decide when I got in my office whether I wanted to turn the air conditioner on right away. Again, not much of a choice. I had to decide how cold the air conditioner was going to be. I had to decide how much I wanted the fan to blow on me. I had to decide then, once I opened my tablet, what I was going to do the first thing in the morning. Was I going to check my email? Was I going to uh, check Twitter? Was I going to do something else? Which music station was I going to turn on on my tablet? So many choices to be made. And this was only maybe the first 45 minutes, maybe hour of my day. See, the choices go on and on. You have similar choices you make every morning as well. Honestly, my conscious effort to pay attention to my choices didn't last any longer than when I sat down in my office. I'd say I chose not to pay attention to my choices anymore. To be really honest, it simply became exhausting trying to keep track of all the choices that we make every day. Every minute I was faced with another choice, some big and very consequential, some small, simple, mundane things that really didn't even matter that much. So as I made the choice not to pay attention to my choices anymore, I decided, made another choice actually, to go on the internet and to search, and, and, and to, to search Google for how many choices do we make in a day. Funny enough, somebody chose to study this uh, at some point in time. One of the studies I read thought that we make somewhere around 35,000 choices a day. Now, given if we sleep, let's say the average adult sleeps maybe six to eight hours in a day, that means that ballpark we make somewhere around 2,000 decisions every hour, which I'm told the math works out to somewhere around a decision every two seconds. That is exhausting to think about. Maybe that's why choosing to take a nap most afternoons seems like a really good idea. Choices are all around us. 
In fact, choices are the basis for almost every story that we involve ourselves in, every story that we watch or that we read or that we take part in. Some famous choices were made throughout history, especially the history of television, the history of movies. You can remember this uh, old Knight Templar, maybe, uh, telling Indiana Jones that he chose wisely when he selected the grail. Every hero or villain in every Marvel movie that's ever come out has had to make a choice between good and evil. In fact, incursions into the multiverse, and if you don't understand that, that's fine. But they wouldn't exist without choices. Gabby and Rachel had to choose who to give roses to this week. Again, did you, if you get that reference, raise your hand, please. Anybody get that reference? Raise them high. One person. Jill, everybody has to go find you after church this morning and have coffee with you and ask who exactly Gabby and Rachel are. Okay? There you go. I found your, your, your coffee partner here this morning. I was watching uh, the track and field world championships last night on TV. A man named Fred Curley won the 100-meter uh, finals last night. Fred Curley wasn't even running the 100-meter race a year ago. He was a 400-meter runner. He chose about a year ago, a little over a year ago, to move, to switch to the 100-meter race instead of the 400-meter race. Now he's world champion. Not a bad choice. Choices are everywhere. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way and entered the house of Martha, they were again choices to be made. In fact, our passage today is filled with choices. It's all about those choices that were made. Mary makes choices. Martha makes choices. Jesus himself makes choices. And as observers, as participants in this story, even ourselves, we are called to choose as well. I'm going to talk about these choices this morning as we go through this story a little bit. The choices that are made and the choices of how they, th these things maybe even affect us. The first is the choice to serve. Now this doesn't sound like a bad choice. But I think in some ways this passage actually was placed here as a bit of a counterpoint to some of the previous passages that were all about people serving. If you were to go back in Luke chapter 10, you can do this this afternoon if you want, you would read at the beginning about Jesus sending out the 72 disciples and about Jesus preaching and saying that the, that the harvest is plentiful, but the, the workers are few. There's need for workers. As we would read on in Luke chapter 10, we would read the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story, a parable all about who chooses to serve, who chooses to act, who chooses to do well. Both of these stories emphasize the importance of working and of serving God and others. Service is important. But I think Luke wants us to know here that it's not necessarily, it's not a means to salvation. It's a result of God's calling on our lives. It's an outpouring of his spirit in us. Martha is busy. Guests had arrived from out of town and preparations needed to be made. Think of all the preparations that you do around your house when you know you have guests from out of town that are coming to stay at your house. The house needs to be cleaned, food needs to be prepared, tables need to be set, maybe even places to sleep or to rest need to be prepared or need, need to be made up. These things don't just happen by themselves, we all know that. And DoorDash, Uber Eats, those things didn't exist at this time. So the question needs to be asked, were these the most important things or the best choices? We can be busy for lots of reasons. We can find ourselves being busy for pr on purpose or for a good purpose. Or we can be busy for busyness sake because there are things that we think maybe have to be done. The things that Martha was doing needed to be done perhaps. But were they the most important things at that moment? Are they what Jesus was looking for in that exact moment? Maybe another way to put this is, are they her agenda or are they Jesus' agenda? This is something we've talked about before, even uh, I think a few weeks ago as we talked about discipleship. We talked about God's agenda versus our agenda. The more I think about the life, uh, the more I look at the life of a follower of Christ, the more I realize that this is really actually a really key and important question. Whose agenda are we following? 
our own or God's. Now, to be fair, they aren't always opposed, but there are lots of times when we make our own agenda God's agenda, instead of making God's agenda ours. See, following Christ means putting aside our own agenda, our own wants, our own needs, our own thoughts, our own things that we find important, and instead following his agenda. Service is good. Service focused on the needs of the Lord, on what God wants us to do, is great. And at this very moment, as Jesus enters into Martha's house, his needs are not food and a place to sleep. His needs are different. His needs include teaching his followers, welcoming his disciples to sit at his feet. He wants them to do this. What he wants isn't to be served food. What he wants is to be listened to as he tells a better story for his followers to follow. This falls in line maybe with the word hospitality. I've been thinking about the word hospitality a lot lately. It's easy to make a list of things that we think make up good hospitality. A good meal, a welcoming smile, a comfortable place to rest, even a listening ear. We can think by doing these things that we're being very hospitable, and maybe we are. But it seems like one of the keys to hospitality is asking whoever it is that is the guest, whoever is the outsider, whoever is the one being shown hospitality to, what exactly their needs are. Those needs might be different. That might be a more difficult question for us to just ask as opposed to simply trying to assume. It involves conversation. It involves listening. It involves putting aside our own assumptions and maybe doing something different than we thought we were supposed to do. It might even mean having to admit that, we, that what we did or what we thought we should do was wrong. It means putting aside our own agenda and listening to somebody else. Service can be a good choice. In fact, service is great. We're called to serve others, to care for others. But I want to encourage you to serve. As somebody whose job it is to, to, in a lot of ways, try to find places for you all to serve, try to find things for you to do, try to plug you into ministries and all that kind of stuff, I, I, I have a hard time standing up here this morning and saying, you shouldn't serve. That's a little bit counterproductive. So go work in a garden. Go hand out a meal to somebody who needs it. Go teach a class. Be a friend. Share life with somebody else. Give of your gifts and talents to anyone who has need. But make sure that service is focused on the Lord's plan and not on ours. Jesus wasn't looking for somebody to serve him food at this moment. Jesus wanted Martha to sit at his feet and to be his disciple. This brings us to Mary's choice. See, just as Martha made her choice, her sister Mary made a choice as well. Mary decided that even though all these other things had to be done or, or maybe should have been done, she decided that it was better for her to sit at Jesus' feet, to listen to him. She decided that was a better choice at the moment. And we see that Jesus commended her for that choice. It's easy to see this choice and to moralize it or maybe even to simplify it. Of course it was the better choice. It's a choice that we all need to make more often. The choice to spend more time with God, more time in his word, more time praying, more time reflecting on who God is and who he made us to be, more time having meaningful spiritual conversations with others about who God is, more time having meaningful spiritual conversations with God. Those are great choices. Choices that I'm pretty sure we would all say are really, really, really good ones, meaningful ones, better ones, even. Is, is it always that simple? I, I'm always reminded of this. My letter of call to the church I served in California for nine years had this clause in it, had this, this little line in it. It stated very plainly that I was to take one day every month for personal and spiritual renewal. 
That's pretty impressive. That's not bad, right? One day every month, and this was, this was, again, this was contractual. This was in my contract. This was in my letter of call. That's how important this was to the church that I served. As I read that, I thought, that's great. That's fantastic. So I was there for nine years, and unfortunately, I can probably count on two hands the times that I took that day every month. Less than 10 times over the course of nine years did I take that day for what it was intended to be. Now, did I not think that it was important? Of course I thought it was important. Did I not want to take that day? Uh, Let's see, a a day that I don't have to be in the office, a day that I get to do other things of personal and spiritual renewal and growth? Of course I wanted to take that day. But life got busy. There was work. There was meetings, there was deadlines and pressures, there was family, there were people to meet with, there was a house to take care of and a garden to tend to, there were friends to see, there were all sorts of other things to do, there were all sorts of other excuses to be made. And I didn't always make it a priority. My agenda took over more often than not. Now, it doesn't mean that I didn't find other times to pay attention to Jesus. It wasn't, it, I, I hope you don't leave here saying there were only, only, only less than 10 times over the course of nine years that Brett paid attention to Jesus. That's not the case, okay? There were less than 10 times that I took this actual day to do this. This has always been a good reminder for me for how difficult it can be to find time to be a follower of Christ. It seems like such a simple thing to do, right? But it's so difficult sometimes, even when it's mandated, even when it's scheduled, even when it's put in to your contract, to your life, it can be hard to find time to set aside, to sit at Jesus' feet. Discipleship is about following at the feet of the master, at the feet of Jesus. Following at the feet of the master at Jesus' feet means going where Jesus goes, doing what Jesus does, making what is important to him important to you. In this encounter with Martha and Mary, what Jesus wanted them to do, what the master laid out as important was for them to be his disciples, to listen to his better story and to sit at his feet. That's the choice. Mary made. Martha made choices. Mary made choices. They were all filled with consequence and meaning. I want to go back to Martha's choice just for a little bit longer here this morning, however. I think her choice also had another choice that went with it. See, as Martha chose to be busy, to do, to serve, and Mary chose to sit and to listen and to be a disciple, Martha also wanted Jesus to to listen to her choice and to make her choice the one that should have been made by everybody. See, Martha tries to impose her choice onto Mary. And so, making another choice, a choice to judge. Martha tries to get Jesus on her side. See, she wasn't happy that while she was working hard, while she was doing all the work, her sister was just sitting there at Jesus' feet. She wanted Jesus to step in and to help her out, to say to her sister, this, you have to get up and help, and help Martha do the work. Tell my sister to help me, Martha says. Reprimand her for just sitting there, Jesus. Tell her to do what I want her to do, Jesus. Take my side, Jesus. Join me in judging my sister for what she has chosen to do. really easy to fall into this trap, I think, for all of us. We see the choices of others all the time. And when they don't coincide with our choice, or when the choice that they make isn't something that we would like for them to choose, we look down on their choice. We judge others because of their choices. This can run from comical to serious. I am by no means the fashion police, but every once in a while I see something that someone has chosen to wear, chosen to leave the house with on their body, and I think to myself, that was not a great choice. We judge people's choice of music. We judge what someone orders at a restaurant. 
We judge what their favorite food is. We judge what people drive. We judge who people are friends with. We judge what people choose to do with their time. We judge people's relationships. We judge people's spiritual lives. We judge how people choose to serve or not to. We judge all sorts of things based on what we would rather see them do or what we would have chosen for them to do. And this can bring about some serious consequences. See, friends, we are a community. One of the goals of community is that everything we do goes towards building up our community. And community suffers when it spends all of its time being an assessment agency for one another. When it spends all of its time judging. However, community thrives when each member takes responsibility for their own walk and allows the community to minister to each other in encouraging ways. Now, you might think, well, isn't that part of our job is to point out sort of the faults of others, to help others grow? Well, yeah, but I think judgment is different from another word that I would use here, and that word is accountability. Judgment is very different from accountability. Judgment is this one-way street that includes condemnation and isn't part of conversation or relationship. Whereas accountability, and this is really basic, but accountability is best done in relationship with large amounts of communication, trust, and love. Unfortunately, we choose to judge others sometimes. Again, most likely based on our own agendas and on what we think is best and not on what God's agenda is, or what he thinks is best. Judgments based on a lack of information or a lack of knowledge are very dangerous. They can harm individuals and community alike. And they're not a choice of discipleship. One final choice that I want to point out in this uh, passage as well this morning. One final choice we need to talk about today, and that's a choice... That Jesus makes. See, culturally, Martha was doing exactly what she was supposed to do. She was doing exactly what was expected of a woman who, ha- who, who was a host. She was preparing food. She was serving others. She was doing the housework that was needed. Culturally, that's what she was supposed to do. And Mary was not. Joining the men and sitting with the, with the rabbi and learning from him simply wasn't what a woman was supposed to do in this culture. But Jesus, again, flips the script on this. Mary chose to sit at Jesus' feet. Mary was a disciple of Christ. It's not something that was culturally intended for women, but it's something that she was nonetheless because Jesus chose for her to be there. Everyone from the most important in society, if you remember back to the story that takes place right before this, the story of the Good Samaritan, it's this teacher of the law. It's this really important person who asks this, this, this question, who brings about this story. Everyone from that expert in the law, who Jesus invites to follow him, to perhaps the least in society, people like Mary, were invited to follow Jesus. Jesus chose to welcome and even to invite everyone to sit at his feet, to follow him, to be his disciples. Friends, in a lot of ways, that brings us to this table that's laid out here in front of us today, a table that all of us are invited to. The only choice we have to make is whether we're going to approach it or not. Whether or not we'll sit down at the feet of Jesus and follow him. Whether or not we will be a disciple of Christ. Or if we're too busy with other things to sit at Jesus' feet. Even Jesus says in this passage, there's only one thing that's really needed. This is maybe a bit of a mysterious saying. He doesn't necessarily define this. Maybe we could ask ourselves, what, is, what exactly does he mean by this? I believe some of the things I've read, and and, and, and seeing the context of this story, I believe that what Jesus is commenting on here is the choice of Mary. What is needed? What's needed is for Jesus to invite all of us to follow him, and he does. What's needed is for us to sit down at Jesus' feet, to approach this table filled with his grace, 
to acknowledge that he is Lord and that you and I are not. To acknowledge that his agenda is better than our agenda. To give up control of our own life and to follow him instead. That is what's needed. Do we do it perfectly all the time? Of course not. And yet Jesus still invites us to sit at his feet and to follow him. And this morning, Jesus still invites us to sit at this table, to approach it with the reminders of his sacrifice for, uh, for us, his death and resurrection that brings about life for us. Jesus invites us to approach this table because, friends, this table is for us is for you and for me. Let's approach this table together as followers, as disciples of Christ. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting us to sit at your feet. Thank you for calling us to be your disciples Lord, we acknowledge that we don't always choose the right thing. We acknowledge that at times we put our own agendas, our own judgments, our own needs, our own wants ahead of yours. And yet you still invite us, yet again, every morning, every hour, every second of the day, to be your disciple, to follow you. Lord, through the love and the grace that was poured out on us, through the forgiveness that you give to us freely, Lord, we can approach this table, this place that you've set up for us, that you've invited us to. Lord, we can approach it knowing full well that you are there to receive us, to teach us, to listen to us, and to love us. I thank you so much for loving us and for accepting us, for being our God as we've been called to be your people. We pray this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite the elders up this morning who will be helping to serve this. And then we're going we're gonna to just wait for a minute for our, uh, our kids to come back up from, uh, from downstairs. Church, join me in this, uh, in this litany of thanksgiving this morning. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light, inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of all life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. 
You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them, we give voice to every creature under heaven. And we glorify your name and lift our, jo- our voices in joyful praise. Join me. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to God the Father that our Savior, Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Whenever you eat this, remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and as he poured it out, he said, This is my blood, which is given for you. Whenever you drink this, remember me. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And therefore, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray together. God of all power, send your Holy Spirit upon us that in sharing the bread we may share in the body of Christ that in sharing the cup we may share in his blood. Grant that, being joined together in, in Christ Jesus, we may become united in faith, and in all things be, become mature in the, in the one who is our head. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us how to pray together. Let's say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Church, all who put their faith in Jesus, who acknowledge that uh, they have fallen short, but who love him nonetheless, are invited to this table to be followers of Christ to sit at his feet, to be his disciples. We'll distribute the cups first, and then we'll distribute the bread, and after everyone has been served, we will take of this meal uh, together as a family of Christ.
family of God, take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. And take, drink, remember, and believe that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed again for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Let's pray together. Most gracious God, we are in awe of your great gifts to us, experienced here at this table. You have given your son that we might live. You have fed our spirits with bread and juice. You have made us one body with all of your children. We are renewed today in our commitment to loving service. We leave here to build your kingdom in this world and we ask that your love will shape our love, that we may reach others as Jesus Christ has reached to us. Hear us, accept our thanks, and continue to walk with us in the name of him who gave himself for us. Amen.
Friends, we have heard from God's word. We have been fed. We know that we have been called to be his disciples, and now we are sent together into the world around us to be his disciples, to follow him into every place that he would lead. Friends, know that we don't do this alone. We do this together as his people, and we do this with his blessing, and so receive God's blessing this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look down upon you and smile upon you always and give you his peace. Go in peace to love God and serve your neighbor. Amen. Amen.